Chapter 2. The Space of Unity, Love and Peace. The snow-white columns of the temple stretched up to its crystal glass dome. Through it, one could see serene clouds floating in the sky. The dome seemed weightless, and the sun's rays pervaded its transparent glass into the great round hall, illuminating the guardian of knowledge. He glided between the rows of students, who parted a walkway for him with respect and awe. Everyone wanted to catch his gaze, full of unconditional love, acceptance and wisdom. This gaze penetrated and touched the soul, awakening it and reminding each person of the part of God inside themselves. Once the students caught the gaze of their master, they smiled and their faces smoothed. It was as if the sage's gaze was the wind that blew bright fire out of a tiny spark, intensifying their inner light. The day in the hall, many people who had been following the spiritual path for several years were gathered. They not only followed this path, but made efforts to help others wake up, help them realize themselves, and introduce them to the knowledge. They came from different cities to talk to the sage, ask his advice, absorb sacred information, and receive tips and help. The master went on a small stage and stopped. A reverent silence hung over the hall. Then he spread his arms out to his sides in a characteristic gesture, wishing peace to all sending his students rays of support and love, letting them know that the spiritual conversation was beginning and that they could ask questions on their sensitive topics. A short dark-haired student asked the first question. There was an incredible femininity in all her movements, and her face looked attractive with an imperceptible harmony and beauty. Even the first wrinkles in the corners of her eyes gave her a special charm. Wise guardian of knowledge, she began, and her ringing voice broke the silence of the hall with a melodious chime. Is it possible to create a community of unity, love, and peace now, in such difficult times? Where should it be located? How should it be arranged properly? The master looked at the woman with quiet confidence, and the edges of his lips curved in a transparent smile. It already exists, Eva, he replied. It exists here, now. This community has already been created, and now we just need to gather as many people into it as possible. We need to bring them into contact with wisdom, so their eyes and hearts will open, so they too may begin to let other people to the true knowledge and help them take the spiritual path. In this way, the divine presence may flourish in the whole world and people will experience sublime emotions more frequently. Then, all of life will change. The sage's answer was simple and succinct. Yet, these words gave the students not only hope, but also certainty that each of their contributions was vitally important and a lot depended on each person. Encouraged by the guardian of knowledge's answer, Eva nodded, but she still had more to ask about. Guardian, how do I properly tune into the power to reach every heart, to be heard and followed by people? She asked, not taking her eyes off the sage. First of all, you have to get emotionally involved and awaken the heart within yourself, smiled the master again, you have to learn to feel more emotion. But how can this help, master? If you speak and deliver information to people more emotionally, people will hear and perceive it better, the sage began to explain. Even if you say the right things and try to awaken other people, if you do not involve your emotions, then of course, people will not understand you or want to listen to you. Once you try to convey your message with great emotions, in a strong state, with confidence, then your entire audience will be inspired by your emotional power, fired up by your idea, and want to join you. Master, how do I awaken the strongest faith in myself? Eva asked again. Act from your heart. Involve as much emotion as possible in whatever you do. Do everything with your soul. Use all your confidence and determination, and then people will listen to you. Master, what will help me believe in my mission 100%? The student asked, looking intently at the guardian. What will help me believe that I really can help people? You have to see what you are strongly attached to, what you identify yourself with, the guardian said firmly. If a person does not believe in their great mission, it means they are identified with something else. What holds a person back? What keeps them from going forward? What stops a person from accepting their way of serving and helping people? What is pulling them, like a stone, to the bottom? We need to understand what the stone is and get rid of it. Once a person separates from all these attachments and identifications, then this person can fully surrender to the divine power. But if a person is holding on to something, they start doubting and spend a lot of energy on their doubt and cannot devote themselves to any kind of service and they won't be able to fulfill their mission of helping people. Beloved master, what can this stone be? Can you give us an example for a better understanding? Asked another student, a very young woman with defined shoulders and a thoughtful gaze. Of course, Vera, he nodded amiably. 
for example, if a person does not want to give up their habits from childhood, from their identification with social roles, for instance, their mother, father, son, boss, employee, Republican, Democrat, etc. We need to understand what roles we are identifying with and see in ourselves the habitual reactions that come along with them, which we learn by associating ourselves with one of these roles. The roles and habits we identify with limits us very much. They do not let us see the world realistically and drastically narrow how we can behave. In the end, they keep us locked in one place and do not allow a person to go to God and develop. All these identifications only block us, limit us, and we must get rid of all of them. Then our heart will open easily and accept having full faith in God. Vera nodded with gratitude for the explanations. The next question was posed by a slender woman wearing a beautifully twisted turban, out of which peeked a golden honey-colored lock of hair. Beloved guardian, she said. I feel that you are the incarnation of the god Narayana, and we are all like his other half, like Lakshmi, in various incarnations divided into a thousand parts. Is this true? Yes, you can say so, Anna, the sage said softly. There is the divine in all of us, and it manifests itself in one form or another. If we tune into the divine in ourselves, we become Narayana, we become Lakshmi, we become other incarnations of God. Then the divine part in us triumphs. And how do you properly tune into that divine part in yourself? Anna asked. The most important thing is that we should not have attachments to some past experience where we were limited, put in a cage of a false personality, and taught that we are weak helpless beings. That we, like robots, had to act according to a program invented by someone else and could not escape from this program, even if we don't need it, even if this program does not allow us to develop and fulfill our true predestination. We need to destroy this cage of false personality and no longer think of ourselves as a robot because we are not actually a robot. And then, once we free ourselves from this cage and get rid of made-up programs, only then the divine incarnations of Lakshmi, Narayana and other gods will awaken in us. Satisfied with the sage's answer, Anna nodded gratefully and reverently, stepping back a little. In the meantime, a young student with a tenacious look had already raised his hand. He wore a simple white t-shirt and jeans, which emphasized his muscular arms and lean sinewy figure. Guardian, he began in a confident, strong voice, do all people need to be saved and taught? After all, there are souls just reincarnated from animals or even insects. How do we deal with them? Vadim, first of all we have to search for more evolved and open souls, the sage explained. Those who are already on a higher level of development, who strive to go to the angels, who can already hear and understand something. To these souls, we should try to transmit the truth to the best of our ability, because they really can perceive it. If we meet someone whose soul is on a very low level of development, then, of course, such a person will not understand anything that you try to tell them. After all, they are trying to live the same life of an ant or an animal in their new incarnation. They have completely different interests. It appears that they only think about food, physical comfort and material things. Vadim clarified. Yes, the master confirmed. Their mind is closed and their heart is closed. They are completely self-centered. Because of that, it is very difficult to get through to them. They will not accept the truth. They can only be awakened by very strong sufferings and misfortunes, by very serious life tests, so that they start thinking about something higher. Therefore it is better to seek the souls who have already experienced many incarnations on earth and learned these lessons, those who are now becoming angels. They will understand you very quickly, because their hearts are open, and they are ready to contribute to the higher mission and save people. Thank you for the explanations, Master, Vadim bowed his head respectfully. I have another question about suffering and misfortunes. He waited and looked at the sage. After his permissive nod, the man continued. If our planet is considered to be hell, why is it so incredibly beautiful and wonderful with seas, sunsets, nature? Do all living creatures suffer here? Naturally, the planet was created by God, that's why it is beautiful, explained the sage with a bright smile. But it is still a material planet and material laws apply here. For example, not only people face diseases and age, animals and insects do too. One animal eats another, and there arises fear or aggression, and then one attacks the other. But in the human world, things should work a little differently, shouldn't they? Humans are considered to be more advanced creatures, right? Eva asked. The sage shook his head no. Unfortunately, there is more misery and suffering in the human world than in the animal world. The difference between humans and animals is that humans have a deformed imagination, therefore all animal passions are increased in them a thousandfold, said the guardian, stating the obvious. 
If an animal is well fed, it will not think of attacking anyone. And what does a human start to do when they are well fed and have everything they need? The question posed by the master made the students think. A wave of low murmurs spread through the group. A human thinks about what they can control, Vadim answered in a confident tone, with bitterness and regret in his voice. Right, the sage agreed. Humans begin to think about war and crime, about destroying cities, about gaining more power and material wealth. At that moment, one of the students, a tall woman with a very short haircut, raised her hand. The guardian made a welcoming gesture, and the woman spoke, trying to make her soft voice as loud as possible in the crowded hall. Master, I realize that God gives people war to awaken them. Does this mean that war cannot be avoided? She asked and, after a short pause, decided to clarify herself. After all, people don't awaken by the thousands. You told us that the truly spiritual people were always rejected by others, and there are few of them, very few. How can we change this and avoid war? Yes, Marina, you are correct. War is intended by God to awaken people. But we must awaken without war or suffering. It is only beasts that have just reincarnated into people that need to be awakened by suffering, war, and other terrible events. A normal, developed, and thinking person should come to understand everything without any suffering or shock. Their heart is already open, they want to experience sublime emotions, to comprehend wisdom and truth. This should help them awaken. They should find other people who are also ready and want to awaken. We have to find them and help them to experience sublime emotions, to go to God, to comprehend knowledge. If we do that, there won't be a need for so many wars and sufferings to awaken humanity. Guardian, there is a saying that if a person does not follow the spiritual path and develop, they inevitably begin to degenerate, Vera said, having asked to speak again. Is this true? Yes, it is true. If a person does not follow the spiritual path, all the animal passions in them intensify. The imagination keeps them awake and makes them insane. I've heard somewhere, the girl went on, that wars are a way to regulate the number of the human population so as not to overpopulate the planet. I do not really understand how this correlates to the divine plan. The guardian looked warmly at his student. It is people who litter the earth, he began to explain, and the earth has already begged God. I can no longer tolerate so many people, because forests are being cut down, there is so much garbage that there are islands of trash floating in the ocean, people hate each other, and so God arranges wars and natural disasters, which are meant to clean the earth. People do not want to come to their senses without these extreme measures. Does it mean that humanity is doomed? Eva asked a question, and everyone could hear notes of anxiety in her voice. The apocalypse is coming, and nothing can be done. No, there is still time, said the guardian confidently. We can begin to pray that people change their minds, abandon negative emotions, and begin to cultivate positive and lofty emotions. When we truly pray and live for people to start loving each other, for the hatred between people to stop, for wars to stop, then something may change, and the date of the apocalypse will be postponed for an indefinite period of time. Then mankind will have the opportunity to keep developing further. The sage's words were received with a lively buzz. The students talked with enthusiasm, sharing their joy that there was hope that each of them could still make an effort to save humanity. When the buzz went quiet, the spiritual conversation continued. A man with sun-bleached hair, gathered into a small ponytail at the back of his head, raised his hand. Sage, what is the fastest way to get rid of all attachments and live only in service? He said in a low-chested voice. First of all, we have to see all these attachments within ourselves, he replied. We have to realize that we take them too seriously. They are just stereotypes and patterns that have been imposed upon us. We shouldn't take our roles in society so seriously. We need to make fun of them, deliberately thicken their colors and exaggerate them, remove them, and laugh entirely at our identification with them. Then we will create a gap between ourselves and these roles. We will disassociate ourselves with them, and we will not take them so seriously and tragically, but will treat them with fun and a good sense of humor. It is the sense of humor that will help us become free of these attachments. The student nodded, accepting the master's answer gratefully. In the meantime, the next question was asked by a student in a long dark green dress. She looked about 30 and emanated soft feminine energy. Sage, I was able to see how much selfishness I have in me, she began. When it is time to ask spiritual questions, I think first of all of myself, of my personal realizations, of my feelings, of what I have read. Even now, when the world is on the brink of war, I think only of myself and not of how to help people. How do I get rid of this selfishness? Atyana, it is very good that you are aware of your selfishness, the guardian praised his student. 
that is an important first step. Now you must understand that it is when a person thinks about themselves that all their suffering begins. Just as they focus on themselves, they will notice. Something is not right, this doesn't work well, this is not so, here is one problem, here is another, another. And negative emotions, disappointment, and more suffering will start. And on the contrary, when one forgets about oneself and begins to think how to help others, how to make others feel better, how to do more good, how to express compassion, love and sublime states towards other people, then all these problems disappear at once. So, when a person starts thinking about themselves, problems arise and they get sick. And when they stop thinking about themselves and think how to help others more, they start feeling really good. Tatyana asked again. Did I understand your idea correctly, great one? Yes, the sage nodded and added with authority. When a person thinks about helping others, God sends them his grace. He was silent, giving his student time to make sense of the knowledge she had just received. So whoever wants to keep suffering, let them think of themselves until they have had enough. And those who realize that they have had enough suffering and need to think about others begin to give love, do kind things, start helping people and lead them to God. Another student raised her hand. It was a red-haired young woman with thin lips, wearing a silk tunic with bright poppies. Beloved master, how do I get rid of the habit of judging others, of constantly looking for faults and blaming someone all the time? How can I stop playing the role that I know everything better than anyone else? Once again, Irina, this is done with the help of a sense of humor, smiled the master. One has to exaggerate this judgment, to remove themselves from it, to laugh at oneself and see how ridiculous and stupid it is. One has to realize that this judgment is nothing. It is just pride. It all makes us separate, as if to protect ourselves with a shell from other people, from the world, from God. And God is unity. God is all that exists. So we must not shut ourselves away in our shell, in judging other people and in selfish thoughts about ourselves, but, on the contrary, open ourselves to people and the world, and open ourselves to God. Then we will not judge other people, but we will think of them positively, trying to find something good in them. Find a bright spot in every person and turn it into a lamp of the spirit. There is something good in everyone, absolutely everyone. We have to see that good and think about how to help people, how to develop that good in them. Irina nodded gratefully, and Anna, a woman in a beautiful turban, came forward. She had already asked her question to the master, but during the spiritual conversation she had new questions that needed answers. Sage, please tell me, is it good to visualize a good future for the planet and for yourself? Or does it mean interfering with God's plans? The guardian thought for a moment, searching for the right words to explain such a difficult topic. A person is affected by three powers, he began his explanation. The power of destiny is the planetary influences on a person. How the planets were in the sky at the time the person was born, what strong and weak qualities they were given, how the astrological aspects are manifested now. The second power, the power of karma, is the influence of the soul's experience from past lives. The soul already received a certain experience in past incarnations, and part of this experience goes to the next life. A person works with the tendencies that they accumulated in past lives. And the third power is the power of God providence. Anna was surprised and decided to specify. What about our own will? Does it mean nothing at all? It is good that you remembered about it, the master spoke approvingly. Our own will is very important. We have to direct it consciously to resist bad destiny. We must strive to unite our will with providence, with the power of God. And. Then we can change our destiny and even karma. Yes. Then we can resist bad destiny and bad karma, affirmed the sage. But if a person does not develop their willpower, if all one's thinking and behavior is completely under the subordination influence of prejudices, programs of society that are instilled in us since childhood, then this person automatically follows their bad destiny, which forms due to these prejudices and suggestions. But how do we exercise our will properly? Anna asked again, wanting to get to the core of the subject. To do that, we have to see where some negativity is influencing us, and how we, in our blindness, are trying hard to follow it. We must trace where there are suggestions, negative programs, and the influence of evil forces. If we can become free from this influence, then we can manifest our own will. Only when we see the evil will that we were guided by before and dictated how to act and what to think, then can we reject it. If we can dissociate ourselves from these suggestions and the compulsion to follow them, and if we become free from the imposed programs, only then we can manifest our own will and unite it with the will of God. After that, our destiny can change dramatically. We are able to improve any situation. 
Just when the master finished speaking, Irina raised her hand again. Sage, what is an evil will? She looked at the guardian of knowledge with incomprehension. Is it when you are forced to go to war? When politicians and the media enforce false ideas on us? Yes. Evil comes to us through television, starting with advertisements. We are advertised a lot of useless things, and people become seduced by all this. They have a desire to buy one thing, then another, and then this and that. We are living in a time of consumption, when people take out loans and buy things that nobody needs. Then there is political propaganda. We are forced to think according to what benefits the top authorities. For example, when there were communists, everybody was instilled with certain ideals, so that everyone would become a communist too. The fascists in Germany instilled their people with other values. A whole system of compelling propaganda was organized to turn people into fascists. But that was before, remarked the girl, pursing her thin lips. And what about now? Nothing changes nowadays, either, answered the guardian of knowledge with a sad smile. Maybe it does not seem so obvious and is more veiled. But it is the same. Some ideas and thoughts are imposed on us, and we are mandated to follow them. Can a person leave the spiritual path because of the influence of these suggestions? Irina asked. They might think. Classes with a master are a bad idea. I do not need them. So is this the evil will that should be avoided? Exactly, said the master. And so, a person must see that they are being influenced and try to avoid it. And is it only the media, advertising, politicians that we are influenced by? Asked one of the students, a young man with piercing brown eyes and sharp features. What about the people around us? Relatives, for example. My father, my mother. They put different patterns in our heads, too, don't they? Am I right? Yes, you are right, Philip, the guardian confirmed. The influence also comes from the people around us, they pass on their delusions, their ignorance, their identifications to one another. We must see how they try to influence us and pass on these beliefs and silly parenting programs. If we reject their ignorant ideals, a real battle can start to happen. When Philip heard the master's words, he leaned forward excitedly. It was evident that the subject was particularly moving and affecting him. I have a good friend, he said, as the guardian looked at him again, giving him the floor. He and I were starting to study together, to do practices. When his relatives found out he was developing spiritually, they started pressuring him, trying to change his mind. They told everyone that he had joined a cult. And eventually he broke down and quit the classes. There was clearly bitterness and regret in Philip's voice for a friend who could not cope with the compulsion of his relatives. The guardian of knowledge noticed it. He looked intently at his student and sent him an energy of support and understanding. Yes, such attacks happen all the time, he said. People around us cannot understand the essence of things and try to pull those who strive for development and knowledge back into the swamp of ignorance. They do everything they can to make this person turn away from the light. We must see this influence. How advertising and publicity work, how the people around us influence us. When we begin to see everything, we can no longer agree with these influences. They will no longer be able to act on us, and we will always be under the protection of God. If we don't succumb to dark influences, then we can easily change our destiny. The sage finished and looked around at the students to see how well they understood his words and explanations, and whether they had any new questions. He saw how Philip's gaze was now transformed. His face now was glowing with extraordinary determination, a willingness and desire to act. Guardian of knowledge, he said eagerly, how do you become a pure guide for people? The master nodded approvingly. A pure guide of the divine power is no longer subject to bad, evil, negative or low influences. He is open to God, to the higher powers, constantly in sublime emotions and states, with pure thoughts. Such a person has no ego, no negative influences, which pull a person in different directions. Therefore we should do spiritual practices regularly, work on ourselves constantly, purify thoughts and move on the spiritual path. Saying these words, the sage again sent his student a warm wave of unconditional love, and Philip's face lit up from within. It was obvious that he believed in the power of his will, that he could walk this far on the spiritual path. Meanwhile, the students kept asking their questions. Sage, what is the best way to tune yourself in any situation, even the most difficult one? How do you learn to accept God's will? Asked a plumpish woman in a colorful neck scarf. If a difficult situation arises in our lives, it means that we think of ourselves again, the master began to explain. It is like a vicious circle. The more we think about ourselves, the more difficult the situation becomes. And when we begin to open ourselves, to think, Lord, how can I help other people? What good can I do? 
then this difficult situation disappears and we gain more power and a sublime state. Then we begin to serve God, to help other people, and our situation changes completely. The woman nodded with gratitude for the answer, and the guardian of knowledge gestured to another student, a bright blonde woman with gracefully curved scarlet lips, who had long held up her hand to ask her question. Sage, how do you keep the mood of the team positive? She asked. How to instill confidence that everything will work out. Allah, for this you need to become more active, to cultivate strong states, elevated emotions, and pure thoughts, explained the master. If you have many states like this, then everything will work out. What should we do if something does not work and dark thoughts come in and disrupt a person's mood? Asked the student again. How do you resist this? If something doesn't work and negative thoughts creep in, we have to keep track of it and understand why it happens. All these dark thoughts come from demons and larvas. We have to cut them off right away. If we don't succumb to their influence, then we will be in a good, strong state and everything will work out. Alla looked like she started to understand it all. Guardian, how can we quickly separate from the lower desires and seductions of social life? Eva asked another question, raising her hand again. One must see these influences as separate from oneself and begin to laugh at them, to exaggerate them, spoke the master. It is important to understand how exactly they influence us, why they make us obey them. He paused and, thinking a little, explained. For example, they try to influence us and say, why are you laughing? Take this stupidity seriously, identify with it. Look, you have to do like everyone else. But if we don't succumb to this influence and laugh at these patterns and stereotypes, if we stop identifying with our roles, then we can quickly discard them. Once we begin to take these suggestions and influences seriously, they enslave us completely, take over us, and we cannot cope with them. We must see these influences outside of ourselves, separate ourselves from them. Then we will be free. Thank you, great master, Eva respectfully thanked him for the answer. I have another question. How do I make more efforts to separate myself from the body and by a robot to understand that I am not my body? For this, too, we need to observe ourselves more. For example, when we approach a mirror, we see a bio robot. We see what programs exist in it, what stereotypes of behavior and negative influences control it, what drives it from the outside. If we look at ourselves in this way, we can quickly separate from it and stop being a bio robot, stop thinking of ourselves as this bio robot. But if we are completely identified with every thought that comes into our head, with every influence and every impression, then it's impossible to do anything. To change and stop being just a bio robot, we have to see ourselves from the outside. We have to see the mechanisms that work within us to see all of these internal processes. And then we will be free of them. As the guardian of knowledge spoke, the students listened attentively, catching every word in order to penetrate as deeply as possible into the very essence of things. When he had finished explaining, Vera raised her hand again. Master, what do you recommend to do in order to observe your biorobot more productively and to separate your eye from your body? It is so hard in the initial stages a simple meditation is the first step, said the guardian gently. What do we always have at hand? Our breathing. We breathe all the time and so we can start to observe our breathing at any time. We focus our attention on it and see. Here comes the inhale, then the exhale, and then the inhale again. If we are conscious at that moment, if we are not identified with our body, with the organism, then we understand that this is a bio-robot breathing, that its heart is beating, that it is moving and making some actions. Thus we become an observer, looking at ourselves from the outside. The more we observe, the more we separate from the bio-robot. The sage answered Vera's question and looked again into the hall, where several more hands had risen, wanting answers. He pointed an open palm toward a graceful blue-eyed woman. Guardian, how do I find the right goal to guide me forward? She asked, excited by the opportunity to know the Great One's answer to her question. There are so many of them, and I am lost the master carefully looked at the young woman with a warm gaze, as one looks at a beloved child who is just learning to take her first steps. The purpose is always the same to develop oneself spiritually and to help others to develop. So there is nothing to be lost about, he smiled, and the student smiled back. Her face lit up with the light of awareness. It was such a seemingly simple truth. Yet coming directly from the sage, it had a deeper meaning and helped to set her in the main direction. Sage, what qualities of my soul gained from past lives should I apply to be useful to the world? A new question came from another student, a pretty dark-haired young woman. Sometimes I feel energy and know that I can influence masses of people, but sometimes not. What does it depend on? It all depends on the part that is turned on in a person, the guardian of knowledge explained. 
There are many parts in a person, and among them there are weak ones the parts that doubt and want to degrade. We must get rid of them and turn on the strongest part the spiritual one. Then we will really be able to influence the world around us. The main thing is not to allow ourselves to be in the weak parts, not to indulge them, not to identify with them, not to act according to their destructive programs. And then we can do a lot. And how do you keep those weak parts turned off? When some weakness or resentment overcomes you, or you feel utterly discouraged. The dark-haired woman asked inquisitively. How do you separate yourself and get rid of that part of yourself? You can become angry with that part. For example, we can imagine or even make a movement like we are making a strike at this part that we push it away from us. And in this way, we will not let it influence us. You can even say out loud, hello. Hello, my weak negative part. I can see you. You're turning on in me again. Go away. This part will go away at once because we have already separated from it, have entered another state, a stronger one, the guardian paused and looked shrewdly at the student to see how well she understood him. The young woman listened with her eyes wide open, and it was obvious that there was an active process of awareness turning on in her mind. If you indulge it, continued the master, if you enter into this negative part, start thinking its thoughts, feeling its emotions, then it completely captures us, starts to destroy us, and it does not allow us to do anything, even the simplest things. Nothing goes right. Therefore, we have to get really angry at this part, separate this part from ourselves, push it away, and then we will really be free and will be able to do everything we want. The student listened attentively to the master. It was obvious that she wanted to ask something else, but she was hesitant and did not know whether she should ask the question. When the guardian looked at her again with a gaze full of love and understanding, she made up her mind. Master, thank you, the woman thanks sincerely. I have one more question. How do you get rid of mental laziness? I strive to help more, but it is difficult for me to overcome the instinctive center. It does not want to go out of its way and only wants to satisfy physical needs. When does the instinctive center start activating? The sage posed a counter question, encouraging his student to think and answer it herself. When we haven't eaten, drank, or slept, the girl answered after a short pause. That's right, the guardian nodded approvingly. Just when a person has eaten, the instinctive center thinks, why should I give them more energy? That's it, now let them sleep. That's why we have to eat less and move our body more. When we're hungry, we do some exercise, we do some sports, then we have a lot of energy. As soon as we sit, lay down, or overeat, there is no more energy. The student looked at the guardian with gratitude. At this stage all her questions had been answered, and she now had a good basis for further self-work. The next question was posed by a middle-aged woman with a teacher's bun on her head and glasses with round lenses. Guardian, how do you awaken yourself so that you do not forget about your important mission of helping people? She asked and, after a little hesitation, added with a feeling of guilt, so much happens that you get distracted, you switch from one thing to another, and the mission of helping people. It becomes like a phase, mechanical. Agatha, we need to understand that it is when we stop thinking only about ourselves and our personal interests, when we help other people, that is when we actually develop. Then the higher powers send to us a great flow of energy, so that it is enough for all those whom we have decided to help. Because of this energy, we also experience success. But often, we are not aware of this cosmic law. We do not understand what laws are applied in this world, and then our mind begins to say, think about yourself, about your ego, about your personal needs. In this case, a person retires into their shell again and inevitably begins to suffer, because only suffering can arise when a person thinks about themselves, when a person again disconnects from the world and has goes into their shell. But how can one avoid this, great one? You have to keep reminding yourself, if I think about myself and my own ego now, then I will start suffering again. If I start thinking about people now, then development will begin. I will be in a good state. I will be able to experience sublime emotions, because I live for other people, and I want to bring goodness to them, to do something kind for them. And then I will feel good. I will feel differently. If I start thinking only about myself again, then again I will degrade, and I will feel negative emotions, along with weak and destructive thoughts. Nothing will work, I will start having problems why would I need all of that. I want to take it all out of my life and walk the light way, helping people, thinking about God, thinking about something elevated. Then I will be in a completely different state. Happy, joyful, fulfilled and graceful. Then I will feel good. Thank you, Master, I will remind myself of that more often. Agatha answered excitedly. The sage sent her a supportive smile, and her eyes lit up with understanding. 
The master nodded to Alla, who raised her hand again. Guardian, I remembered what else I wanted to ask, she began. Could you tell me, please, why some women have some circumstances before the seminar that make it difficult for them to get there? There are always obstacles. Why does this happen? That's a very good question, Alla, the sage complimented her. These obstacles are nothing more than the identifications of the person. Women suddenly begin to remember before a seminar. What will my husband say if I am not at home? Who do I leave my child with? I have to find someone to stay with them. How will they feel without me? What will people say? The more of these identifications this woman has, the more restrictions and chains appear. These chains, like shackles, do not allow her to move, hold her in place. The woman feels that she can do nothing. She is held by these zombie programs, and she begins to follow them. She no longer thinks about her development, about the amazing opportunities that attending the seminars will open up for her. It seems to her that there can be nothing like that in her life. She has to see it all and say, why do I need these chains? I don't need them. If she really really wants to attend a seminar, then God will begin to help her, and everything will be good for this student. The long spiritual conversation was coming to an end, and the sage felt that the students had already received enough knowledge to comprehend and keep working on themselves. He felt that now they would be able not only to develop themselves, but also to help other people to wake up and take a spiritual path. The guardian looked around the hall and saw that the student, who had not yet asked any questions today, still held her hand up. It was a woman in a modest white headscarf. From the back rows, she had made her way to the front with concentration, intent on getting an answer from the master at all costs. The sage nodded approvingly at her, and the woman spoke. Guardian, I cannot understand when people say that a person is one. And that everything around them is also them. Her voice gave away her excitement and the desire to figure out and to reach an understanding of the truth. For example, if a person loves someone, one loves oneself. If one hates someone, one hates oneself. If one judges someone, one judges oneself. She hesitated, trying to find the right words to express her thoughts as accurately as possible. She thought for a moment and continued. I understand that we all come from one source, the divine. And we are all like-minded souls. But I can't quite picture it. How is it? The soul is one, and the others are all its mirrors. I really want to figure that out. The student looked at the guardian with hope, waiting for his answer. When I was in seventh grade, the guardian began, I studied anatomy and read in a book how the brain works. It said that the brain has nerve cells and neurons. Every impression we receive is recorded in a certain group of neurons in the brain. The sage paused, looking intently at his student, whose face became even more focused. Does it have something to do with human unity? She clarified, not quite understanding what the guardian of knowledge was getting at. It is just an example, but it will help you to understand the essence, he smiled enigmatically and continued. It turns out that every person we know is recorded in such a group of neurons. If we hate someone, the group of neurons that is responsible for our eye sends a hate impulse to another group of neurons that represents that person. I think I'm beginning to understand. The student exclaimed and her eyes flashed like a candle wick with a match to it. So, there is even a war between these neurons and our brain on the physical level, right? Yes, that's right. Well done to figure it out, the master complimented the woman. If we feel negativity toward someone, some brain cells are starting to destroy other brain cells. And the brain is a very important part of our body, so we end up destroying ourselves. This example shows that if we feel hatred or bad emotions, we are destroying our own brain. But when we feel love, grace, then all parts of the brain start to unite into one, no cells die there, no one destroys each other. Then our brain is in harmony. All of its parts begin to unite into one whole. Thank you, master, the student said with passion. It makes more sense to me now. But what if we move away from the physical level and look more globally? If you take a global view, all human souls are parts of God. That is, God is everything. He created every person. And every person is a part of him. For example, we are his little finger. We are all parts of this one huge unified whole called God. But we can separate ourselves. For example, we may think, I am the little finger, and everything else is a hostile body around me. Conversely, we can say, so it's all me. I am not just a finger, I am connected to this whole body. I am not separate from it. If I were separated, I would die. The guardian looked again at his student. Her face reflected even more of the awareness that was occurring in the very moment of the here and now. The finger would have atrophied and died, unable to exist apart from the whole body. Do I understand correctly? 
the woman inquired, that you need to feel its connection with the rest of the body. Yes. And then we will feel unity with God. We'll understand that a person is not just an isolated little finger, which should be even more withdrawn, shut off. On the contrary, this finger must open up and merge with the whole body, with the whole world, with everything that is God, and therefore, with all that is around us. Then we will feel a completely different state. In the silence of the temple the words of the master sounded solemn, yet so simple and clear, that all the knowledge was now united in the minds of students into a single harmonious picture. This picture, painted by the hand of God himself, was absolutely beautiful. Every brick, every pebble, every grain of sand here had its place and its meaning. And now let us make our vows to God and open our hearts to love and peace, said the master, and everyone began to recite the lines of this poetic vow in unison. Dear God, I swear, I won't break my word I gave you long ago. And if in the struggle, I falter and lose courage, the darkness of hell is the penance for me. I am ready to endure any trial that I am destined to have on my path. I wish to strengthen in God's will to gain freedom forever at last. If in the fuss of life, I ever fail to walk the path that you have kindly showed me, then let the fiery arrows of passion tear my heart into pieces. To break the shackles of fuss and judgment, I spend my days training and praying and all that I promised God I will do with honor, I swear. In our extreme times, when the fate of the entire planet is at stake, it is crucial for the knowledge of angels and benevolent spirits to spread as quickly as possible, globally, and reach thousands of people. In this way, we can change the future of all humanity. Which is why we are addressing you, dear soul of light. Spread the knowledge about our wise books and films. Share links to videos or cartoons. All of this is available and free. Invite women to individual practices, webinars and seminars. And the great spirit of light will help you and your family it will direct an enormous amount of energy to fulfill all your desires. Benevolent spirits and angels will assist you and your loved ones in all matters. A thread of light and love extends from your heart to the hearts of thirsty women. And the creation of good and the dissemination of enlightened knowledge throughout the world begins. Become part of the mission of light Help people and God will help you.